All right, welcome back to JML Studios. I'm Joshua Lutz. And here we have 15 of my favorite absolute distilled mix tips and tracking tips for all you audio engineers and engineers and Jedi Nears out there. So stay tuned to the very end. I have a massively powerful bonus tip. So just watch the whole dang video. Like, sub, hit that bell so when I make these videos, you are notified. Share this with a friend who's also studying to become a better mix engineer and help them become better too. Before we get to number one, what is your goal to be an engineer, producer, or self-recording artist? Well, the goal is to get natural sounding recordings. Obviously, sometimes you want unnatural sounds if you're manipulating the sounds with the plethora of effects or dirtying it up to tape or post, but by definition, a high quality audio recording is best described as audio that sounds natural. In a high quality recording, you're not gonna hear hums, hiss, microphone handling, plosives, overly processed effects or any unwanted mistakes. So again, this is assuming you're going for high quality recording and not lo-fi, task cam, four track vibe, which has its place. But most of us are here to get better sounding mixes. So while there's no one right way to get quality recordings, there are foundational pillars of great recordings and I'd like to share those with you right now. Number one, you've heard this before, mix at low volumes. You know, maybe this just doesn't work for you, or you've tried it, but you don't understand why, or you just love pumping your own music so you can feel it. Well, it's time to try the mature, time-tested tip that almost every mastering and recording and tracking engineers use for a reason. There's two big reasons we mix at low levels. First one is mixing at low levels allows you to hear the overall mix better than a loud mix, and loud mixes always just sound better, so it's like cheating. The main reason, however, well, third reason, is you can't hear what the compressor's doing at high levels. At low levels, dynamic processing becomes more apparent and obvious. This is just as important as reference monitors. So try mixing at low volumes. Number two, the compressor is a hammer, and to a compressor, everything is a nail. Parallel compression is a game changer, and it is far less destructive and is far more giving. Parallel compression blends an already slightly compressed track or stem, or submix if you will, with an uncompressed copy of the track. It helps raise the overall level of the signal without destroying any particular peak in the signal in the process like standard compression does. These peaks are the energy and the emotion of music. A peak in a signal also is the most fragile component of the dynamic sound, and it's the first thing to go when you slap an LA-2A plug-in on that track or on any particular signal and hammer it down, especially on drums. You get to keep all your dynamics, which also yields the dynamics of forward-facing volume. So try parallel compression, level up, and mature your game. Number three, multiple compressors, multiple reverbs, multiple EQs daisy-chained into each other are the secret sauce of many an engineer. Daisy-chaining like gear, is the secret on thousands of records and I encourage you to try it for at low levels. A compressor with a ratio of one to one to another compressor with one to one or two to one ratio will yield an incredible sound and so many engineers talk about this and it may be something you haven't tried. I once daisy chained six reverbs into each other, convolution, plate, spring, all into each other at low mix levels and I got the most lush track that I had, that I had ever heard and it simultaneously compressed the audio so I didn't even need to compress which was an unexpected surprise. That's what happens when you experiment. You are happily surprised or sadly disgusted, but that's what happens when we experiment. We want to be experimenting and finding new sounds. That is our job as an engineer. Number four, there's a secret to achieving a predictable mix outcome I will now share with you. Do not solo mix. Solo mixing is the worst thing you can do for your overall mix, and there's hundreds of YouTube videos specifically designated to this one trick. And it's not really a trick, it's just best practice. You mix the song, not the track, or the stems, not the solo track. Well, you invariably will get a great mix when that solo track, you put them together, and it's gonna sound insane because bass and guitars especially, they sound unrecognizable from when they're dumped into the rest of the tracks because the individual frequencies, when mixed with other frequencies, they fundamentally change when combined together and barely resemble themselves on a frequency analyzer or an oscilloscope when you mash them together in a whole mix. If we already know this, why are we still soloing tracks to get them to sound good by themselves? We need to mix stems together and then mix the song, because we're wasting time and shooting ourselves in the feet when we're just constantly soloing tracks. I've worked with engineers like Christos de Sandlis, Robert John Lang, and Russell Elevato, and they all have one thing in common. They mix stems, not tracks. Why? Because tracks don't behave the same when placed in a full mix like an entire finished stem will. A solo track is like an unsupervised four-year-old going to Chuck E. Cheese. When you first get them in the room, isolated, by themselves, they're 
very well behaved and you tell them, hey, you represent my family, you represent our last name, you go out there, you be a good little kid, and the kid goes, okay, I promise, I will. And then you send them into the Chuck E. Cheese, what do they do? They're complete, they act erratic, completely different than they're supposed to. This is what we're doing when we solo a track. We're getting an unexpected result when you put it into your mix and you say, what happened to the bass? What happened to my mid-range? What happened to that forward-facing, beautiful, punchy guitar that I had? Where is everything? Why is everything all over the place? Why are these frequencies completely different than when I had these tracks soloed, when I put them together? Now you know, I'm telling you right now. It's JML Studios tip number four. We just explained it. Number five, do something you've never done in every session. The greatest discoveries come from accidents and mistakes. We already know that. But a great engineer once told me, put yourself in a position to fail as much as possible, especially when you're learning. Fear is the enemy of an engineer. Conventionality, conformity, that's 99% of the industry. But the rule breakers are the top 1% of the artists, producers, and engineers. Sylvia Massey is running audio through garden hoses to get unique sounds. You should be coming up with your own way. One day I was at Electric Lady in the A room and Swizz Beats told the GA or somebody, to go get a bucket, a five gallon bucket, and fill it with water and to bring him a tambourine. And I remember all, all the other engineers were kind of like, what is going on over here? The dude puts his whole arm up to his, you know, past his elbow with the tambourine in his hand underwater, and he starts to shake it. And as he brings it out, it creates this incredible, like low pass filter effect, um, like, an, like an envelope filter. It was just like, it like, the high end just kind of bloomed and blossomed and it created this aquatic sound. Do something you've never done in every session. All right, so number six is don't mix the same day you track. So if you're mixing 10 songs, CLA talks a lot about this. If you're mixing 10 songs, wait till you're on the 10th song and you finish it to go back to the first song to start mixing. Unless you have to fix some mistakes that you made right in the moment, it's best to be furthest removed from the original mix ideas and you, you get these blinders on when you're in recording mode where you're just tr trying to get very specific sounds. Don't dive headfirst into the mix as soon as you're done tracking. In general, the consensus is that's a bad idea. This goes especially for y'all weed smokers out there who've been cheaping on that devil's lettuce and you think every idea you have is absolute fire. And we all know that you have a heightened sense of what you think is fire when you're smoking. And I've been in recording studios for 30 years around all kinds of drugs and I can tell you that marijuana is a creative band-aid, not a creative solution. And I know there's a lot of weed smokers out there that vehemently disagree with me, but um, take it from me, it's just as addictive as alcohol or nicotine or any number of hard drugs. And it usurps your creative energies and it usurps your time and talent. And that couch lock is not the place to be writing your great opus. Anyway, number six was don't mix the same day you track. Number seven. Number seven is don't slap EQs and compressors on everything as soon as you're done tracking and you're going into that mix phase. Relying on outboard and plugins to create the sound that you heard in your head, I always feel is like a bad idea because you can get that sound with proper mic placement and starting out listening to references before you start the tracking process. And you'll say, you know what, if I wanna get this dirty snare sound, I'm gonna detune my snare, I'm gonna use this specific hypercardioid mic, and I'm gonna use this old big Ampex tape machine preamp and that's going to give me this dirty sound I'm looking for or I'm going to tape a cardboard box around an SM57 to get that old funky Motown vibe not okay just put whatever mic you have laying around on there hit record and then we'll fix it in post that's such a bad idea and so many engineers end up with these I, I go into these mix sessions in these studios and you look at their DAW in, the, in Pro Tools and it's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plugins and they're like, yeah, look at all these auxes I use and check out this super complex convoluted signal flow and these chains that I have to get these sounds. And I'm thinking, what happened to creativity in the tracking process? Do not rely on plugins and outboard to get a sound. Understanding signal flow is just scratching the surface of what it takes to be a great engineer. And EQ, if you're going to use it, try subtractive EQ instead of additive EQ. Try using your EQ only to reduce frequencies. My favorite blues guitarist of all time, Albert Collins, said, by the way, if you haven't heard Ice Picking, it's one of the greatest blues albums of all time. And I said that like a white guy, because actually the name of the album is Ice Picking. He says, you never start out an argument with your girl by yelling at her. It always starts out in conversation. 
You don't have to jump into a mix and you start bang, 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 LA 2A, 1176 everywhere. It, that's a terrible way to do a mix. Obviously some genres require very specific processed sounds. And if that's the genre you're working in, you gotta do what you gotta do. But this is just a general tip. Do not rely on plugins and outboard. Rely on proper mic choice, mic placement, and recording techniques. Take care of one another, love one another. Peace and love, Planet Rock. Yeah,